Most Americans know something about Jim Crow segregation. Most Americans know that legal segregation was used to deny African Americans their civil rights. What most Americans don't know is those same laws were used against Native Americans in the South. In 2013, the council for the Pascagoula River Tribe came to me and asked me to uh, do two things. They asked me to help them get acknowledgments from the federal government, and they asked me to tell their story. So I promised to do that, and today I'm here honoring that pro uh, promise to tell you part of their story. Now, who are they? The Pascagoula River Tribe, their homeland is about 20 miles inland on the west bank of the Pascagoula River. They have an agri uh, archaeological culture that goes back 1,900 years. Do you know where your ancestors were specifically 1,900 years ago? They do. They are direct descendants of the Pascagoula, historic Pascagoula tribe and Frenchmen. And the children that come from those intermarriages were called Creole during that time period. Now, in 1764, a majority of the Pascagoula tribe moved west of the Mississippi River. The uh, people that remained behind became the Pascagoula River tribe. Now, this is specifically their genealogy. During the colonial period, colonial authorities didn't really keep track of individual Native Americans, but when they married people of European descent, they kept track of that. Magdalene Boudreau-Paquette, she had multiple children with uh, two different men. Uh, she is an ancestor to 100% of the tribe. Uh, John Baptiste Boudreau, uh, who was her half-brother, he had multiple children with two different women. And he is ancestor to about 75% of the tribe. And an unnamed native woman uh, who married Pierre Ladner, who was the great-grandson of Magdalene, uh, is about, an ancestor of about 50% of the tribe. And at some point, uh, it, several generations as you got into the 18th century, their descendants started marrying into each other, and especially after 1764 when the majority of the Pascagoulas left. And in the 19th century, 10 other people uh, with various levels of Native American ancestry married into this tribe. And then by 1900, over uh, 200 people lived in the traditional homeland with a, a few other families that had moved off to nearby towns and nearby counties. Now, what is a Creole? Originally in the 18th century, a Creole was a person born of a Frenchman. The Frenchmen born in the homeland were Frenchmen. The people that were born in the colony were, were Creoles. Uh, today in the state of Louisiana, it depends on where you are. It, it, sometimes it reflects your African-American ancestry. Sometimes it reflects your Native American ancestry. Sometimes it just reflects your French ancestry. But there's always a French or Spanish an ancestry connected to it. So it, it, it changes from community to community as you move through the state of the, uh, Louisiana. In Mobile, Alabama and Pensacola, Florida, it means you have predominantly African-American ancestry with some French and or Spanish ancestry. In Northwest Jackson County, near Van Cleve, in the tribal homeland, which lies between these two areas, it originally meant that they were children of Frenchmen, and that carried through to the 20th century. But in the 20th century, it became a racial slur. It became the equivalent of the N-word, and it was used to deny them uh, their heritage. It was used to po point out that they were not white, and it was used because they had such a small community to, to insinuate that something was wrong with who they were. And so as a result, that word denied them their heritage. And so we get to segregation. Now, racism doesn't make any sense. Racism is built on fear and ignorance. Legal racism, segregation, is illogical. It creates conflicts, it creates controversy, it contradicts itself. And when you look at the schools, this, this required the county to have three different schools for three different races, African Americans, Native Americans, and Anglo Americans. And some of the records that, I, that they have for the school, the state requires them, required them to identify the race of the, uh, the children that they were teaching. And, the, and, and some of the teachers wrote in, Indian, white, Creole. That's absurd. That's absurd. They had to have separate churches 
They had separate cemeteries. They couldn't be buried in the same soil. Uh, seating on public transportation shows the contradictions. In the early 20th century, Native Americans could ride with whites in the, in the, uh, on the railroad, in the railroad cars. African Americans could not. But later in the century, as you got to buses, Native Americans and African Americans had to sit back behind whites. They had to give up seats to whites. When you got in the local theater in Van Cleve, Mississippi, Mississippi specifically, we got it, you get into a situation where African Americans and Native Americans had to sit in the back behind the whites in the balcony, separated from the whites. When you got into indoor dining, and it was a white establishment, African Americans and Native Americans could not eat inside with whites. They had to go behind the restaurant to get their meals and leave. And this is where there is a difference between those two, the, the two co communities, African American and Native American, in that the African American community was much larger, had connections to outside the Van Cleve area, and there was a black middle class, and so they had some of their own businesses, and they had some of their own restaurants and that catered to their community, and that community was not near where the, the, the Native American community was. So there really wasn't a lot of options there for Native Americans for anything, and they were too small to really have any kind of uh, economic infrastructure. And this, this is the same with uh, in employment. Yes, in Jackson County, Mississippi, whites got better, had better employment. African Americans got less than, but they were able to generate more within their community than the Native Americans could in their community. When it came to health care, the closest hospital was in Ocean Springs, uh, Mississippi, that's down on the coast, and they had an African American wing, and they had a white wing. They didn't have a place for Native Americans. And when they showed up and they had to stay in the hospital, they were left in the hallway unless the staff could find somebody that was in a, a white room or in an African-American room that would allow them to stay in that room. Otherwise, they were stuck in the hallway. Uh, the first school created for, the first public school created for this community <coughs> occurred about 40 years after the African-American community and the white community got their first public schools. These students could not go to the white school, they could not go to the African-American school, and they could not go beyond the eighth grade. African-Americans could go to the 12th grade, whites could go to the 12th grade. See, again, the contradictions just don't make any sense. On top of that, they weren't taught their, their history, uh, their Native American history, or their culture. They were just taught a basic education. Um, they only got one bus, and that only came in the 1930s. And if you couldn't get to the route of the bus, you couldn't get to school. Uh, most of the students lived miles and miles away from the school. The first school was built on property given to the tribe, uh, given by the tribe to the county. They built the school, but the county ran it, and they had a board of trustees that helped the county run it. In 1950, in response to the successes of the civil rights, and they could see the writing on the wall, they started to try and address equal but separate. And so the county built another school for the community. The previous school was, was a wooden building, one room building, had an outhouse and had a, a well outside for water. This building was a concrete building, concrete block. It had one classroom for 60 to 70 students, two to three teachers. It had indoor plumbing, but you had to go outside to go in the door to get into the bathroom. It did not have for most of its existence a cafeteria or a lunchroom or anything like that. Beginning in the 1960s, as the Civil Rights Movement was gaining momentum and gaining successes, they adjusted and tried to keep as much of the uh, Jim Crow uh, segregation as they could. Jackson County uh, allowed the students that could go to the high school to go to the high school, go to the white high school, as could the African-American student. And some of the students stayed in, at, at, the, at, the, uh, uh, at the Live Oak School to get their high school diploma. Some went to the school and they faced significant discrimination. And discrimination didn't end with uh, desegregation because the white teachers and the white students really would never accept these students in, in the classrooms. So how did they cope with this? Well, they, they had their own schools. They had a government that helped run the schools. And then they created their own Indian churches. Uh, there was three different denominations. There was a non-denomination that began at some point at the, in the late 19th century early 20th century, lasted the 20th century. It was a brush arbor church. It wasn't a physical building, but they had a graveyard of about 30 people in it. It was in the woods. And for most of that time period, a timber company owned the land. And then at some point in the middle of the 20th century, people stopped going there and they stopped putting people in the cemetery, but they kept taking care of it until the land was sold. 
and the owner that moved in tore down the gravestones and wouldn't let the, let the people come back. And it's still, they're still banned from going to, into that area now. There were 11 holiness churches created. And these churches were created to, as, as the community started to spread out across southeast Mississippi. They, they started following the railroad industry and the timber industry, and they had these little enclaves. Well, they began to create these holiness churches to deal with, uh, to help each of these communities as they went. And it, did more, it was more than just religion. Uh, they had preacher's ties which were, the, that were designated to share between the churches. So it's a kind of an intertribal situation to make sure each of the churches is taken care of. Most of the churches as they spread out were house churches, but there were a handful of them that were also a little bit bigger churches. They had fifth Sundays. Fifth Sundays were, uh, the fifth, any month they had a fifth Sunday. Every, all the congregations would go to one of the bigger churches. And they would fill the inside up, and then people would stand outside listening. They'd open the windows up and open the, open the doors up. And they would all stand outside to hear the sermon. When the, or the morning services were over, were over, they had dinner on the ground. And they shared. And everybody brought what they could bring. And even if you didn't have anything, everybody shared with you. And this was, this was, a, this was another intertribal thing to help, to help the people of the community. And then they had services in the afternoon. Then they had poundings. This was if you had a family that had problems with uh, food, with health, somebody was sick or they needed something, the, community, the churches would get together and collect what they needed. They called it a pounding because if they needed food, somebody would bring a pound of sugar so, or somebody would bring a pound of flour, somebody would bring a pound of bacon. That way they would make, make sure that each group had what they needed. And then they also had, at Christmas, they gave out uh, fruit and candy. The, the, the candy was, regardless of the economic situation of uh, the family, the children had something to look forward to. And the fruit helped the families get through the winter. Now, the other church was the Beulah Baptist Church, and they all sometimes participated in the fifth, uh, the fifth Sunday situation. But they were part of uh, the larger of Anclay Baptist Church until 1908 when there was a split. And the white congregation kept the church. They started having to meet in houses. And then when the school was built, they started meeting in the school until they built their church next to the Beulah Cemetery, which I'll get to in a second. It's a still active church. It's a very small church, but it's still an active church in the community. Now, the first holiness church was built in Van Cleve, and it's still there. The congregation probably met in a brush arbor, and then they moved into a small house. The small house burned down. Then they built a, a, a larger worship hall. This is one of the places where they had the fifth Sundays. Uh, it burned down once, probably twice. Oral tradition is whites came and burned it down to, to run them off. Uh, it didn't work. Today they have a larger hall across the street and it has its own graveyard. The first church built outside of Jackson County going with the other enclaves is the Holiness Church, the Three Rivers Holiness Church, which was right outside of Gulfport. Now it's been kind of uh, swallowed up by Gulfport. But it was also another one of the places where they had fifth, had fifth Sundays. The other thing that's interesting about this is they had ties with Native Americans in Oklahoma and would bring some of them in for revivals that they periodically had at Three Rivers. Now the Beulah Cemetery. This also shows this, the, the really bizarre situation of Jim Crow. The Reddickses were a middle class a fairly well-established African-American family in the area. And the tribe did not have a tribal cemetery. They gave land to the tribe so they would have their own cemetery. So this actually shows different, the, the two different groups working together. Sometimes they were pitted against each other by the laws, but sometimes they worked together. In this case, you see, if you see, these are fairly recent pictures. But it, as you look, it looks like there's a lot of vacant space. There actually isn't. It's almost full, but it, and it doesn't have headstones because during... Most of the 20th century, most of the tribe did not have the uh, money to put up headstones and markers. Periodically, they have these events. And every year they have these annual reunions, and then they also have annual events. And there were about 12 big families when the, when the tribe uh, was about 200 in 1900, and those families grew. But the reunions are kind of, they, they are a, a, a social cycle because each person is usually connected to three or four of the bigger families. And when they marry somebody else, and a lot of the kids that went to the school married each other. So as a result, they all have these connections. So as each of the family reunions meets, they get together. And, they, and this is kind of a continuing cycle every year. Some of the bigger families have 
two reunions in a year. And then sometimes smaller segments of those bigger families have their own reunions. So they're always planning when they have the reunion so that they can all go to the ones they want to go to. And that actually helps carry them through Jim Crow. They also have these annual events, cookouts. Like there's a day before Labor Day cookout that's been going on for 50 years. They used to have uh, an all denominations uh, cookout on Easter Sunday. It didn't matter where you were. Some of the, some of the tribe are still Catholic with a holiness, Baptist, whatever. They would go to this cookout. And they have these intertribal things to deal with the fact because during Jim Crow, they couldn't go anywhere. These things still exist. Now, history is a wrecking ball. It crashes through the present into the future. You think you have free will, but you don't because you're being dictated by your past. Decisions have been made in the past by you and others that dictate the direction you have. You only have so many choices. For the Pascagoula River tribe, Jim Crow's legacy is a negative wrecking ball. It crashes through and they have very little control. It's, there's a lot of economic problems, health problems, Yes, that's all there. They are not a recognized minority. They are not accepted as white, and they are not a recognized minority. This is where, in the African-American community, they have legal recourse for things that are done to them sometimes. These people don't have anything. And this is why recognition is important. Recognition, acknowledgement by the federal government, and this, these are the definitions for it, but what it really means is the federal government is get, providing the tribe with cer certain protections, certain benefits, uh, and, and certain entitlements. And there are 574 tribes uh, that are currently recognized by the federal government. How do, you, how do you get recognized? Well, in the 19th century, it was through the treaty process. You know, the government made a treaty with an Indian tribe that, that recognized it and that those treaties hold to the present day. In the 20th century, it's really a hodgepodge. It didn't make any sense until you get to 1978, and the Department of the Interior, through the Bureau of Indian Affairs, created a process for uh, tribes to request being acknowledged by the federal government. You can still go to Congress, you can still go through a U.S. court, but in both situations, they'll ask you if you've been to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and if you have it, they'll say, go there first. And so that's where most go. Now, in doing this, the Bureau of Indian Affairs has specific definitions. An Indian group is what the Pascagoula River tribe is now. The government will not tell anyone they're not Native American, but they won't recognize them. They won't create a government-to-government -government relationship. They, if you have that relationship, you are an Indian tribe. And to be a Native American, according to the United States, you have to be part of one of those tribes that they have a government-to-government -government relationship. They don't care really about your actual ancestry do you have that relationship? Are you part of that community? And community is part of what's going on here. You have to prove a community through time. And that's what we're trying to do with the Pascagoula River tribe. Uh, what do they have to prove? They have to prove they're descended from a, a historic tribe. They have to show they're a distinct community. Didn't Jim Crow do that for them? This is the irony of Jim Crow. Jim Crow actually created the evidence we need to prove they are who they say they are. Um, they have to show that they've preserved cultural institutions, social institutions, and political institutions. Well, they had a government that ran the school. They have quasi-governments with the, the holiness churches that continue to this day. They have the, 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 they have the annual reunions. They have a lot of things that, they, that we think will work. And they have to prove that they have a government, to go, a government that can handle a government-to-government -government relationship. The history of this process, the BIA started this in 1978. More than 360 tribes have started this process. Only 52 have finished it. 34 have been denied. Only 18 have made it. So the odds of even completing the process, it's so, it's so filled with red tape and bureaucratic paperwork, it's hard to do. To actually succeed, it's rare. Now, in doing our research for this tribe, we, we the, the tribal council went and requested uh, a historical marker for the second school. They got it, and they had an unveiling, and one of the teachers showed it. This is one of the happy moments of, of what's coming out of some of this, and it's actually building, it's kind of building up around this time. They had, in 2018, the unveiling, and one of the teachers showed up, and they had an impromptu reunion. There's a lot of, the, a lot of her former students were there, and that was, you know, one of those happy things that happened. Um, Here's the marker that they were able to get. There's four of the students that went to that school. What are they doing? Well, they formed a council. They have a government. 
Uh, they're working on more historical markers for the churches and for the cemeteries. They're doing community outreach to teach their own people their heritage because they don't know it. They were never taught that in school. And they're going out, and they're very active going out to non-natives and teaching them the heritage of this tribe that has always been there. Uh, they're also working hard to take care of the needy in their community. They're working very hard also to acquire land in case they do get acknowledgement because the land base is like the build, where you build economic stability for a tribe. What does this mean for the uh, Pascagoula River tribe? Well, what this means is it's an opportunity to correct a negative legacy. It's an opportunity to use acknowledgement to, to divert that wrecking ball, to change the direction, give it, give it a new arc. It, they will have better health care. They will have better education options. They will have better economic options. But in the long run, it gives them a chance to create a new legacy, to move forward to better, better and bigger things. I want to thank you for letting me come here and tell their story. It's only part of the story, but thank you very much.